This is Special Relationship, a podcast from Mike and The Economist. I'm Celeste Katz from Mike. And I'm John Prado from The Economist. Today, we're going to be talking about Brexit. The Brexit vote might seem like a strange topic for a podcast on American politics, but bear with us. Essentially, Brexit is about Britain voting to leave the European Union. But for our purposes, it matters because of the so-called special relationship, after which this podcast is affectionately named. While the UK's relationship with the EU will change, uh, one thing that will not change is the special relationship that exists between our two nations. But it also matters in this election season, because to many people, the Brexit vote seemed to suggest that politics in Europe and in the United States had come into some kind of weird Trumpy alignment. First, though, let's talk about why Americans should care about the internal politics of the European Union. Joining us now is Robert Tuttle. He served as United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2005 to 2009. Ambassador Tuttle, thanks for talking with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. So a partisan divide has already opened up over Britain voting to leave the European Union. And the White House made it clear before that vote that the administration would really prefer if Britain had stayed in, had chosen to remain. But a lot of conservatives are actually very excited about this. They're celebrating it as a kind of a second Independence Day. So our question is, why should Americans really care about this? What, is it, what does it mean to us? Well, it means a great deal to us because of our long and... <laughs> the overused phrase, special relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, I happen to be a person who uh, wished they had voted to remain, but but it's just uh, how important British uh, the UK is as an, uh, an economy and an ally of ours for so for so many years. And I think that's that's why it's important. And that's why it's important that the special relationship continue to grow and flour- flourish. And did you feel strongly about about why the UK should remain? Uh, did you have uh, personal reasons or or economic, social, political reasons for that? Yeah, I think the decision obviously is not mine, but it was up to the British people. But um, I think that the uh, United Kingdom, being such a it, 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 it such a strong democracy, such a strong believer in free trade, uh, such a strong uh, promoter of, of democracy and freedom. That uh, especially at this time when the, when uh, Europe is under such pressure from its uh, neighbor on the east, Russia, that it would have been great for the UK to remain. But but I think that um, it it'll still be a very very positive influence in Europe, uh, no matter whether it stays in or stays out. Ambassador, the vote here in Britain has been seen, rightly or wrongly, as uh, by some people anyway, as a vote against globalization, you know, a vote against open borders and free trade. Do, do you think that globalization is sort of stoppable? Or do you think the fact that air travel is relatively cheap now, you know, technology knits the world together, means that globalization is kind of a one-way street? And no matter what voters say, you know, we're, we're heading down that street. I, before I get to that, I might say the little bit that I have read uh, would be that it might be more had to do with the migration issue rather than uh, globalization. Um, I think that uh, if you really look at it on an unbiased way, that the globalization has been positive for the world economy everywhere. We've seen tremendous growth uh, in the world economy, and especially in underdeveloped countries over the past 30 or 40 years. So I think it's positive, and I think, John, globalization is here to stay, no matter how people feel about it. And, uh, Ambassador, uh, one thing we really have to ask you is, uh, how do you see the special relationship changing under uh, future President Clinton or a future President Trump? Uh, what, what do you think will be different about, about the uh, connection? I think that's a very good question. I think no matter who wins the election this fall, the American election, that the special uh, relationship will continue to be very strong. First, we have so much in common. Our history, our culture, our language, uh, our business relationship, our intelligence sharing, which has gone on for many, many years. So I think there's so much uh, driving it. And I think uh, both candidates um Although it, I, I must say that uh, Mr. Trump's a little more difficult to predict, uh, but I think both in cl- candidates will pursue the special relationship, as I hope the 
the new uh, uh, prime minister will, uh, whoever he or she may be, uh, I guess that will be decided in September. But there, there's just there's just a gravitational pull between our two countries that I think will can continue to to be to be strong, and uh, and I think it's a benefit uh, both for Europe and the entire world. Ambassador, when you were in London in that magnificent residence where I was the other day to celebrate July Fourth, um, presumably a big part of the special relationship from America's point of view has been that Britain is a great kind of entree into the European Union. Um, with if that ha- happen, you know, if that ceases to be the case, and and there's some doubt over the mechanics of Brexit, but let's imagine for the sake of argument that Britain is kind of out of the European Union tomorrow. Um, if that happened, presumably the future a- ambassador to London would be slightly less important. You know, the State Department would go straight to straight to Berlin if it you know wanted to try and influence European politics. Uh, John, you you have a point there. Uh, I think it'll always be one of the most desirable posts, and I was uh, just so uh, lucky to have served there for three and a half years. It's a, it was, it's a great, it's a great city, it's a great country, and as you pointed out, the uh, ambassadorial residence set on twelve and a half acres adjoining Regent's Park is a very special place. But don't forget that the um, underpinning uh, of the relationship between the United States and Britain and uh, uh, the continent is NATO, and and NATO will continue uh, whether Britain stays in the EU or or goes out to be very very important, very very strong. And if you've seen recently, John, uh, there's been a, a a really resurgence of NATO in Eastern Europe and in Northern Europe, where uh, troops are going in because of the uh, hijinks uh, perpetrated by Mr. Putin in in Crimea, Ukraine. Ukraine and the and the threats against Eastern Europe and Northern Europe and all the propaganda that's been spewing out of Russia. So, uh, just remember, NATO preceded the European Union, and uh, the uh, we are of course the uh, major contributor. But the UK is the uh, one of the countries that spends, I think, the, other than the United States, the highest percentage of their GDP on defense. So. That's absolutely uh, critical, and that will continue to be important whether Britain stays or remains in uh, or or leaves the uh, uh, European Union. Uh, Ambassador, if I could ask just very broadly, um, how do you see the the future of international relations under a new administration? Um, you know, being different from from how things have worked out during the uh, the the eight years under President Obama. Um, I think that, uh, let me talk about both candidates. I, I think Secretary Clinton, everything, I am not I am not an intimate of Secretary Clinton, but everything I've read and the people I've talked to, I talked to someone the other day who was very high level in the administration, I'll let them remain anonymous, but thought that uh, Mrs. Clinton as president would be uh, tougher than President Obama has been uh, in, in the area of foreign affairs. And uh, Perhaps uh, I don't know if this is the correct word, but perhaps a little bit more hawkish, which would certainly fit with my uh, approach to international relations. I think the the president uh, Obama made some a couple of critical mistakes, uh, not getting a status of forces agreement in Iraq and withdrawing all our troops, and also after not following up on his threat to Syria. Uh, when they use chemical weapons to uh, to uh, said if you'd use chemical weapons, there would be repercussions, and he didn't act on that. I think a couple of big mistakes, uh, but I think that Secretary Clinton is very serious uh, and will and would be very good in these areas. Is certainly better than President Obama. Um, unfortunately, I think that uh, Mr. Trump is much much harder to read. We don't know. He is uh, he's very. Um, it goes back and forth, uh, depends on who he talks to or what he says. Um, just as a matter of personal um, prejudice, I voted Republican my entire life, but I will not be voting for uh, Mr. Trump this fall. I'm going to be voting for uh, Secretary Clinton. So perhaps that, that's the best answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Was not expecting that, but okay. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't an easy decision for me to make. As I said, I, you know, I grew up in a Republican family. I've served uh, two Republican presidents. I worked for President Reagan for six and a half years and uh, was fortunate to receive a great appointment for President Bush for three and a half years. Uh, but I just don't feel that uh, Mr. Trump has the background or experience, and some of the things he's said have just 
I find very, very troubling. So uh, this was a time when I, at least for me, I think I'm praising country ahead of party. Ambassador, can I ask on that? I mean, clearly you view um, Russia as very important in, in foreign affairs. So is the thing that alarmed you most about Mr. Trump the sort of friendliness towards Vladimir Putin? Or is it the temperament thing? I mean, several Republicans I've spoken to, particularly Republicans in the, who are engaged in foreign policy, just think that he has the wrong temperament. You know, the idea of him having the nuclear codes at his disposal, they find terrifying. So, so what is it? Is it sort of specific issues or is it, is it temperament? I think a number. Temperament is one. And secondly, John, we just don't know. There's been inconsistency. I think there's been a lack on his part of a real effort to study the issues. And I must tell you, he's never had any government experience. I happen to think that that's important. Um, I read an article the other day comparing Reagan to uh, President Reagan to Trump, uh, that's, uh, which I thought was ridiculous. President Reagan served as a two-term governor of California. He spent a lot of time writing and thinking about foreign affairs. Uh, so, so that's very important. And Trump has none of those experiences. And I happen to also think that his uh, uh, business uh, record is is not one that I would want to present to the American public. He won't even release his tax records, and he comes up with different things. Uh, he seems to have, he's very good at one thing, and that's branding, and he's been very good at, at uh, tapping into the uh, unhappiness of a lot of uh, voters, but I don't think that qualifies him to be president of the United States. Um, the easy decisions don't come to the president, and I'd be very uncomfortable with uh, Mr. Trump making the tough decisions. Do you think that that this feeling would be universal or near universal among other heads of state if if Donald Trump were to become president? Uh, we've already seen some unease, but let me say this: if he wins, uh, then I would hope that he uh, has develops good relationships with the uh, leaders, as the you know, the, certainly the Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom, the leaders in Europe. I think it's very, very important. So. If he does win, uh, then he is my president for better or for worse, and I hope he is successful. But um, uh, between now and then, uh, and between Election Day, I hope someone else uh, is, is the victor in this election. Well, Ambassador Tuttle, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Joining us now is Jeremy Cliff, a colleague of mine at The Economist, who writes a column about British politics. He's in Berlin right now. Actually, Jeremy, why why are you in Berlin, out of interest? I actually live here. <laughs> I, I, sp- I split my time in a very European way between London and Berlin. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not looking forward to the visa queues when we do leave the European Union. Yeah, that's going to be interesting for you, right? Um, Wow, I mean, the free movement of labour is a you know is very up close and personal from where from where you're you're sitting. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm the epitome of the European dream. That's how I see it. Wow. So you've written quite a lot about a newish divide in politics, which instead of left versus right, is about open against closed. And you've written about that in the context of Brexit. I think it's something that people in America have been talking about in terms of American politics as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Of course. I mean, this was something that was going on in Britain uh, for a while before the referendum. And I think the referendum really just brought it to the surface. Um, In Britain, like in America, uh, for much of the past uh, couple of decades, there has been something like a consensus about the desirability of globalisation, about how you manage a modern economy. And um, what what has emerged in the last years, particularly in the aftermath of the financial crisis, is is a new politics in which um, the focus is not so much, you know, do you want a high tax? or a low tax economy, how much do you want to regulate? But how much, how open are you to the wider world? And, and the, the, the way people line up along this, and I think, again, this, this is true on both sides of the Atlantic, is you have uh, urban dwellers, younger people, particularly those who are well-educated, who have the qualifications equipping them to do well in a globalised economy. They tend to be on the open side of this argument. And th- for these people, you can read, broadly speaking, I guess, Democrat voters in the United States, uh, voters who voted against the Brexit in the United Kingdom. And and on the other side, you have those who are older, less well qualified, and perhaps are struggling more in, in, a, in, a, in a tough globalizing economy, um, who are on the closed side, who want to uh, put up barriers, whether it's to immigrants or to trade. And I just think this is, this is increasingly salient in, in, in our politics. 
Jeremy, you did a column a while back about voting in which you said that more and more people in the UK treat voting as a kind of an act of self-expression. You know, I vote this way because it's an expression of the sort of person I am rather than as a way to choose policies they might like or which they might benefit from. That seems quite familiar in the US. You know, we've had the culture wars sort of voting going on for a while. But can, can you tell us a bit more about that in the British and, and even European context? Yeah, in in some ways, um, I mean, this this feels a bit like the Americanization of European politics. European politics, unlike uh, its American counterpart, has not had decades of uh, battles over religion or guns or these issues that aren't really what you'd call bread and butter issues. They're not to do with how much people earn, whether they can put food on the table, what sort of public services they can access, but they have to do with morality and identity and who you are. Um, and that's really kind of blossomed in Europe in the last in the last few years, um, in particularly on the populist right. And the uh, campaign for Brexit really epitomised that in Britain. Travelling around the country on the campaign trail, I visited a lot of leave events. Um, and what was interesting was that although people talked about some of the more uh, prosaic uh, arguments for leaving the European Union, so less regulation, um, uh, supposedly less, not you could avoid paying money into the European budget, those were those really took um, a, a backseat in, in, in the arguments that you heard in the, at these rallies, at these meetings. People talked about, again, this phrase, having our getting our country back, we want our country back. They talked about immigration, not in terms of the uh, sort of transactional benefits and disadvantages of it, but as this uh, sort of slightly amorphous force that is changing Britain for the worse and that represents a sort of unknowable and uncontrollable world. And the out campaign, the the pro-Brexit campaign really tapped into this feeling. And, you know, they they stumbled across this phrase that their, their official slogan was vote, leave, take control. And so it was this more kind of American, more emotional, more to do with morality, um, this different sort of politics. And it, it, it's very striking as someone who, in my case, has always really covered European politics, covered British politics. It did feel quite new, but I don't think it's going away. Just in the, the aftermath of the referendum, there have, been, there have been protests on the streets, some would say a bit too late now, uh, by Remain voters who feel that they have lost their country, that the pluralistic open Britain that they um, cherish uh, has been somehow um, voted down in this referendum. So we're just talking a lot more about, about identity, about who we are um, and about what it means to be British. But of course, the flip side of this is that when you move into this territory, when you're on this exp sort of expressive politics territory rather than a more prosaic instrumental politics territory, um, you're in this sort of this slightly post-fact zone. Statistics, expertise, knowledge, they take, um, th th they're not so prominent. And I think that the danger for those on the, on the open side of these arguments is that that plays into the hands of of the populace of people like trump of uh, some of those on the, road, on the on the leave side of the debate in britain um you know if your politics is about who you are and what you identify with you it doesn't really matter if you've got your your facts and your figures right and you can uh, you can weave all sorts of myths out of out of out of what out of the reality people experience so it's dangerous territory but i think it's territory in, into which we are moving ineluctably in a, a few recent campaigns, we've seen a real upsurge in excitement by young people. Uh, certainly, uh, President Obama, when he was then the senator and ran, uh, energized a lot of young people and a lot of people who hadn't been involved in the process before. And again, you've seen it in this cycle, particularly with uh, Bernie Sanders, who uh, is uh, not uh, looking like he's going to get the nomination, but brought a lot of new people into the conversation. So it's, it's interesting to me to hear your thoughts about how this will uh, reverberate through through British politics and European politics generally? Will it, you know, um, will it change the way young people think? Will it make them perhaps more uh, intent on uh, on having their way now that they've seen what happened? I mean, what, one of the things I think that Americans and particularly Democrats can take from Britain's um, uh, referendum is the, the the importance of mobilizing youth turnout. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, the referendum was lost by the Remain campaign for lots of reasons. But one of them was that they failed to turn out younger voters who were overwhelmingly for staying in the European Union and who were going to bear the longest, uh, will, will, will pay the price for Britain's decision for the longest. Uh, they didn't turn them out in the numbers they needed. There's one study which suggests that um, youth turnout, the turnout of those between uh, 18 and 24 was just 36%, which is much lower than what it needed to be for Remain to win. And I guess the same the same challenge confronts Hillary Clinton, assuming she does secure the nomination. Um, you know, she is, in many ways, in, she embodies the establishment. She doesn't have that ability that Bernie Sanders seems to have to, to turn out young people to excite them to 
to tap into their idealism. And that was exactly the same with the Remain campaign in Britain. It was fronted by uh, competent and decent and reasonable politicians who just seemed too um, status quo. They seemed too... Um, too tied up to biz, big business, too uh, evocative of 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 of, of, what, of what there is and what not not what can be. So I think that's that's a challenge they should take seriously. Was there was there any discussion about what more might have been done or what people didn't do well as far as turning young people out? I mean, at the same time, as you say, it's the you know uh, the younger generations and those that follow that are going to have to live with the consequences of this decision. So I'm also curious as to whether there was a sense that that people kind of dropped the ball on that, that they didn't take responsibility for their own political future. Well, part of the problem in Britain was that uh, the party that tends to do best among young people, the Labour Party, uh, really wasn't fully engaged in the referendum. Um, Brit the, Brit the British Labour Party has moved to the left in the last year. It's led by a figure who has been compared to Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, but who, for various uh, reasons to do with the, the uh, British politics, uh, is pretty Eurosceptic, wasn't very enthusiastic in his support for the European Union. Um, and, and, and the whole party seemed a little reluctant to get to get involved. And I think that was part of the problem. When the Brexit vote happened in America, a lot of there was a, a lot of instant comments saying, look, you know, Trumpism has come to Britain or has come to the European Union. Uh, does that analogy make sense to you? I mean, you're looking at that from the other way around as a person who knows European politics really well looking at America. Do you think there's a lot in common there? Or do you think the differences are actually kind of greater than the similarities? Obviously, there are, there are national differences. And uh, in many ways, Trump is, from looking at it from a European perspective, is quite a distinctly American phenomenon. You can see that the roots of Trumpism going back into, into the Republican Party, into American politics uh, for, for, for a while. But I think it is valid to compare the two, uh, notwithstanding the kind of caveats about differences between different countries. You know, in both cases, you, whether you're talking about the Brexiteers in Britain, uh, other populists elsewhere in Europe, for that matter, and Trump. You're talking about people who who trade in a very emotional sort of politics. They talk about taking their country back. Um, immigration functions not just as a as a kind of uh, uh, just another policy issue, but a proxy for all sorts of um, doubts about the modern world, concerns about how society is changing. Um, and likewise, I mean, in terms of the people who they're up against, you know, whether you're looking at Hillary Clinton or David Cameron, those who are or Angela Merkel for that matter here in Germany, um, the, the, the problem that the establishment has that those who are broadly speaking on the open side of these arguments have is how do you combat that kind of emotional, almost post-fact politics um, in a way that is actually, that is true to your uh, outlook? And I, I don't think any of them have a perfect answer to that. Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us. A pleasure. That's it for this week. Join us in another two weeks on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts for another episode of Special Relationship. I'm at John Prado on Twitter. Celeste is at Celeste Katz NYC. You can also leave us a rating or a review in iTunes. We read those as well. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Celeste Katz with Mike. And I'm John Prado at The Economist. See you next time. <laughs>